Anyone serving as a soldier gets involved in civilian affairs, he wants to please his commanding officer. 2 Timothy 3, verses 3 and 4. And so Timothy wasn't to be distracted from the warfare. Timothy was to be a dedicated soldier. Timothy was to give himself 100% to fighting the good fight. And so the picture of the Christian as a soldier is well known in the New Testament. And friends, this is no surprise, because in the Old Testament, God's people were called to stand for the Lord in the midst of their enemies. The Lord gave his people back then the Psalms, not simply as inspired worship songs, but also as inspired warfare songs. These songs that we have in the Bible are battle hymns which were to sing in the midst of our daily spiritual warfare with enemies encircling us. And I think this is so much needed today within the church to realize the place of these songs in the spiritual warfare we're engaged in. And so the call to God's people to live as soldiers of Christ, it comes throughout scripture. And yet today many Christians do not live as if we're engaged in a cosmic spiritual warfare. The average Christian, it seems, lives like a civilian rather than as a soldier. Yet our Lord's command is loud and clear. You are at war, do spiritual battle. Well, as we consider this vital theme this evening, there's much to think about concerning this warfare. And it's crucial that you and I take to heart what God says to us in his word about this. This evening we're going to focus on just three key issues of this warfare. Firstly, there's our adversary. Let's think together about our adversary as soldiers of Christ. Who are we fighting? Who is your enemy and mine? When we open our Bibles, the answer is obvious. In Ephesians 6.11, Paul speaks about the wiles of the devil. In verse 12, he spells out how our fight is against the principalities, powers and rulers of darkness of this present age. Our battle is against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. So as soldiers of Christ, our warfare is with the devil and his legions. That is what God's word insists upon. Now, in our secular age, many today, of course, just dismiss the existence of the devil. But that is simply evidence that the devil is doing his work fairly well. The devil delights when people don't believe in him. Jesus called the devil the father of lies because the devil is the arch deceiver. The devil specializes in spreading deceit. And so plainly, the devil's able to convince millions that he doesn't exist. Friends, there's nothing more dangerous than having an enemy that you don't even believe in. God's word couldn't be clearer. The evil one is real. The devil is a living being and the implacable enemy of God and his people. Jesus himself described the devil in very telling ways. In John 8, as a murderer from the beginning, and as a liar and the father of lies. Jesus described the devil in Luke eleven twenty one 21 as a strong man, fully armed. And in John 14, verse 30, Jesus described the devil as the ruler and the prince of this world. And then the, then the apostle Paul spoke of the devil as the God of this age in 2 Corinthians 4, verse 4. And also as the ruler of the kingdom of the air in Ephesians 2 verse 2. The apostle Peter wrote that the devil prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. 1 Peter 5 verse 8. And then in Revelation chapter 9 verse 11, the apostle John called the devil the angel of the abyss, that is the angel of the bottomless pit. Friends, the devil exists and he's warring against Christ and his people ruth ruthlessly. Belief in the devil is not helped by the cartoonists, of course, because their cartoons caricature the devil 
as a red-faced creature with horns, a tail, and a toasting fork in his hand. And so many laugh at the very idea of the devil. Because when they hear the word devil, this ridiculous image immediately springs to mind. But scripture doesn't paint for us any such ludicrous picture. For the devil is a spiritual being. He's a fallen angel. Indeed, the Bible reveals that the devil is a living superpower, an evil genius, unspeakably cruel, incredibly cunning, wielding sinister power. When Adam and Eve disobeyed God, they were enticed by their own evil desires, yes, but the devil was doing his dirty work, wasn't he? Whispering his twisted lies into their minds. When Job was tempted to turn his back on God, the devil pressed in hard to get him to rebel and sin. When Judas betrayed Jesus to the authorities, we read in John 13 verse 27, Satan entered into Judas. When Paul, the apostle, tried to go to Thessalonica to spread the gospel, he had to write to the Thessalonian Christians that, quote, Satan stopped us. 1 Thessalonians 2 verse 18. So Paul didn't get to Thessalonica at that time. Therefore, it is clear that the devil uses unbelievers and attacks believers. The evil one stirs up trouble against us. The devil can oppose us in a wide variety of ways. Think firstly how the devil can trouble, can trouble us physically. Yes, physically, he can trouble us. He can attack our bodies. Paul spoke of his thorn in the flesh. Now, nobody knows for sure just what this thorn in the flesh was, but it was a bodily affliction of some kind, it seems clear. And Paul described it in 2 Corinthians 12, verse 7, as a messenger of Satan sent to torment him. This thorn in the flesh was a messenger of Satan. In other words, he had this persistent physical pain or weakness which he couldn't have coped with if it hadn't been for the grace of God. The physical pain was a messenger from Satan, but he suffered from it in God's providence. And even though it was very distressing, God was using it for his spiritual good. In Luke chapter 13, we're told about a crippled woman. For 18 long years, this dear woman was bent over she couldn't straighten up at all. When Jesus came and healed her, Jesus declared that it was Satan who had bound her for all those years. But now by his power, she was set free. In Job, we read of the devil stirring up the wind, killing flocks, and even creating thunder and lightning storms. So clearly the devil in his power under God's providence, can afflict us physically. Now, of course, this is not in any way saying that all illnesses and calamities are of the devil. But the devil is behind some illnesses and calamities. The Bible makes this clear. Our enemy can trouble us with physical affliction. So physically, we're not exempt from the devil's attacks. But we have this wonderful reassurance. The devil can't do anything to us without the express permission of our loving Lord. Now, along with his physical assaults, we can also be troubled by the devil's mental assaults. This is something which I think we'll all be familiar with, I'm sure. The devil is active in the minds of unbelievers and in the minds of believers. Think firstly of how the evil one works in unbelievers' minds. We're told in 2 Corinthians 4 verse 4 that the minds of unconverted people are blinded by the God of this age. This is utterly sobering. The vast majority of our fellow men all around us here in Belfast are being blinded by a ruthless tyrant so that they cannot see the glorious King of Kings. 
That is the picture painted in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4. The devil darkens people's minds. That's why unconverted friends of yours can't see the gospel unless the Spirit opens their eyes. They can't see it by themselves, and so they can't believe in it. Their minds are closed to it because they've been blinded. That's the devil's dirty work and dark work in the lives of unbelievers. And therefore, we've got to pray for the Spirit to shine the light and truth of Christ into their minds. We all know that such unbelievers can be very bright and brilliant in their field of study. Indeed, such unbelievers may be professors at universities and high up in academic circles. I listened some time ago to a debate between Professor Peter Atkins, a professing atheist, and Professor John Lennox, a Christian and creationist. Professor Atkins is a top scientist and academic, but his mind is darkened and he's suppressing the truth. The, the debate was over the question, can science answer everything? If you watch the debate on YouTube, you'll see how Professor Atkins is blind to Christ the King. So it's clear the devil is very active in the minds of unbelievers, but he's also very active in the minds of believers. In 2 Corinthians 11 verse 3, Paul warns us how our minds can be led astray from sincere and pure devotion to Christ. The evil one can influence you and me in this way, leading us astray from sincere devotion to Christ. We need to beware our adversary has power to distort our mental faculties. Jesus underlines this danger by describing the devil as a liar and the father of lies. This is a major part of our enemy's evil strategy against us. He's out to deceive you and me. He's out to confuse you and me. He's out to twist our thinking. For one of his main aims is to disorientate us as followers of Christ and to make us downcast. The devil has another very telling title in the book of Revelation. I'm sure you've heard it. In Revelation 12 verse 10, he's called the accuser of the brethren, the accuser of brothers and sisters in Christ, because the devil fires all sorts of false accusations at us. And the devil delights in causing you and me to despair. And so the enemy attacks Christ's people mentally. Indeed, our minds are the real target of his evil onslaughts. Friends, your mind is a real target for his evil onslaughts. This is where the battle, the spiritual battle, rages most. It's imperative to be aware of this and to know how to deal with his assaults on your mind. And we're going to come to that shortly. And so our adversary, the devil, can attack us physically and he can attack us mentally. And of course, he can also attack us spiritually. In the early church, there was this married couple who deliberately lied to the church. Ananias and Sapphira brought a gift to the apostles. And Ananias and Sapphira tried to deceive God's people into thinking that they were giving all the finance from a sale of their property to the church, when in fact they were withholding part of it. Well, God removed Ananias and Sapphira from this world in an instant. Ananias' and Sapphira's shocking punishment is that they were struck down dead. And the Lord did this to demonstrate the seriousness of their sin against his people. But Peter also highlighted Satan's part in Ananias' deceit. Peter declared to Ananias before he died, Ananias, how is it that Satan so filled your heart that you have lied to the Holy Spirit. This demonstrates very dramatically that even this common sin of dishonesty, the devil is at work in. Friends, men and women suffer defeat at the hands of the evil one 
in our dishonest dealings and utterances. We've got to be very, very careful. What a solemn warning for all of us. For all of our hearts are naturally twisted and deceitful. And so we can easily fall into the sin of pretense and hypocrisy and play acting in church. When we sin in this way, repentance is essential. Be warned, Satan attacks Christ's people spiritually. And so he can attack us physically, mentally, and spiritually. And another warning, the devil also can attack us personally. He doesn't simply attack Christians generally. The devil is out to get us personally at times. Peter warns us, the devil is a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. The devil knows you and me. He's not omniscient. He's not all-knowing like God, but he knows where you are most vulnerable. Indeed, he knows your Achilles heel in your Christian life. And so he'll keep attacking you at that very point. For if he can cripple you there at your weakest point, he knows that he'll be able to ruin your walk with Christ. Everyone born of the Spirit is a soldier of Christ. Well, the devil is out to stop us fighting the good fight in any way he can. He knows us well, and he can attack us in a very personal way to achieve his goal. Christian friends, this is the adversary we face every day. This is the enemy who's out to destroy us. He's determined to ruin our service as soldiers. He seeks to stop us fighting in this spiritual warfare. He's ruthless and he's dark. Beware of your adversary. Let us think secondly about our armor. Our armor. What does our commander provide for us as his troops? What are our supplies as soldiers of Christ? Well, we have been given armor by our captain. We've been given spiritual supplies. In warfare, supplies are crucial. We see that in Ukraine this very day. Ukrainian forces are dependent on supplies from other nations in their fight against Russia. You can't fight if you don't have supplies. Good equipment is essential. Well, in this cosmic spiritual warfare, Christ equips us with all that we need. For he's given us the whole armor of God. The key purpose of this armor is to help us as soldiers to stand in the battle. Indeed, this spiritual armor enables us to defend ourselves and to withstand our enemy's attacks. Note Paul's exhortation in Ephesians 6 verse 13. Put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground and after you've done everything, to stand. And so the Bible tells you and me, Christ has given you all the equipment you need for this warfare. What you must do is to put it on and use it. My Christian friend, Satan is determined to snuff out your witness in this day and generation. It's essential that you use this equipment from your commander or you'll not be able to stand and fight the good fight. And each part of the armor is vital. The first part is the belt of truth. The Roman soldier's belt was far more important than our belts today. My belt is, is quite important, but it's not that important, really. The Roman soldier's belt was like a leather band that helped cover the lower part of his body and tie everything together. The Roman soldier's belt was essential for keeping everything in place. Well, the belt of truth is essential for you and me. For God's truth keeps everything in our lives in place and holds you and me together. Christian friend, the truth of this inspired book is to direct every part of your life. This book is to shape both your private and public life. Its truth is to influence all you do and who you are in every situation. The belt of truth is vital. And so too, the second part of the armor, the breastplate of righteous. Now, this is my favorite part of the armor. 
This breastplate of righteousness is a picture of the righteousness of Jesus that he gives to us when we repent and trust in him as our Saviour and Lord. At our conversion to Christ, we're completely cleansed of our sinfulness and we're also completely clothed with the perfect righteousness of Jesus. And so the Holy God of Heaven accepts us with open arms as one of his precious children because of Christ's righteousness covering us. Hallelujah. Now, Satan is the accuser of God's people, as I said earlier. And Satan enjoys reminding us of our past sins and failings. And he tries to paralyze you and me with, with guilt over sins that we've already confessed. Because then, if he's able to paralyze us with guilt, we'll feel totally defeated and useless as soldiers of Christ. But what happens if you and I remember that we've Christ's righteousness covering us, that Christ's righteousness is our own through faith? Friends, we can silence Satan. We can resist our accuser and make him flee. For we can simply say to him, when he reminds us of our own right, of our unrighteousness, we can simply remind him that we're not trusting in our own righteousness. We're relying on the righteousness of our Savior. And it's Christ's righteousness that makes us wholly acceptable to God. And so the perfect righteousness of Jesus, it's like a breastplate because it covers all of our imperfections and impurities. It hides all of our sin and transgression and iniquity. The breastplate of righteousness, hallelujah. It's imperative for us as soldiers of Christ to put this on by faith day by day and hour by hour. Because this is where our enemy is bound to attack us, accusing us of our own unrighteousness and failings and sins. So the breastplate of righteousness is essential equipment if you're to be effective in its warfare. And so too the third piece of armour, the shoes of peace. In verse 15 of Ephesians 6, Paul writes about having your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. Having good strong sandals was really important for Roman soldiers. Their sandals usually had hobnails on the soles. These sandals gave the soldiers firm footing as they faced the enemy and engaged in battle. Plainly, if you don't have firm footing as a soldier, your position is pretty hopeless. What gives us as soldiers of Christ firm footing? The gospel of peace. Because of the gospel, we know where we stand with the Lord. We're assured that we have peace with him. We know that in Christ, we have access to God and his grace. And it's in this amazing grace of God through Jesus that we can stand moment by moment. And because we can stand in this grace of God, we're able to face our enemies' assaults. And we can bring the gospel of peace to a world that's at war with our God and King. My Christian friend, are you putting on these gospel shoes day by day? Are your feet standing firmly on the grace of God? And are you always ready to share this good news of God's grace with those who are stumbling and falling in their sin all around you? These gospel shoes are essential, as is the fourth piece of armour, the shield of faith. In verse 16, the apostle exhorts us, in addition to all this, take up the shield of faith, with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Now, the shield of faith protects us as Christian soldiers from the fiery darts of the devil. This shield guards us from wicked thoughts that our evil enemy fires into our minds. Roman soldiers had great tall shields. These shields that the Roman soldiers had were about four feet high. And the whole man could get behind these shields. And they protected the soldier from whatever was fired at him. Well, Paul takes up this picture. My fellow soldier of Christ, God has given you a shield like that. And as you use this shield, everything the devil fires at you can't touch you. But how do you use the shield of faith? Well, to start with, let's 
answer the question, what is faith? Faith is basically taking God at his word. Christian faith is believing what the Lord has said in his truth, in his gospel. So what's involved in using the shield of faith? Well, when the evil one fires his wicked lies into your mind, using this shield involves turning your thoughts immediately to the truths of God's word and putting your faith in God's gospel once again. Therefore, using this shield of faith means not listening to the, level, the devil's lies, but rather relying on the truths of the word of the living God. My friend, rest on what God says in his truth, and the devil's lies will never harm you. For as you keep trusting in God's word, it's like holding up a great shield which Satan's fiery arrows can't get through. And so it's imperative that you can use this shield. For your enemy is heartless. He's out to destroy your mind and your soul. Well, closely linked with the shield of faith is the fifth piece of armour, the helmet of salvation. This is our fifth piece of armour, and obviously a helmet protects a soldier's head. Well, the helmet of salvation protects the Christian's mind. Satan is a deadly deceiver. Satan's out to dominate your thinking with his lies. As we wage war against him, what we focus our minds upon is all important. We must fix our eyes upon Christ, our commander, and upon his great glory and grace. We must meditate upon the greatness of our salvation in Jesus. Our minds must be taken up with the wonder of what God has done for us in Christ. Our thoughts must dwell upon our identity in Jesus. And we need to reflect on our, on our eternal inheritance in heaven. We must keep reminding ourselves of the inexpressible joy that lies before us in glory. Therefore, wearing the helmet of salvation means being mindful day by day and hour by hour of the greatness of our Saviour and of our salvation in him. Finally, Paul mentions the sixth piece of armour, the sword of the Spirit. The sword of the Spirit is the word of God, as we're told here and as we're told in Hebrews 4 verse 12. My fellow soldiers, of Christ here in Knock Bracken. It is as we use this sword along with prayer that we defeat the evil one. This is exactly what our Saviour did in the wilderness. Jesus was led by the Spirit into the desert for 40 days to be tempted by the devil. As Satan attacked our Saviour, Jesus fasted and prayed and he used the word of God. Three times the devil tried to tempt Jesus to sin with his, dis with his despicable lies. But three times Jesus declared, it's written, it's written, it is written. Three times in the midst of the spiritual battle, Jesus kept coming back to scripture. Jesus used God's word like a sword to cut through the devil's deceit. And the evil one had to flee. The devil was driven away. The devil was powerless when confronted with God's truth. Friends, the message is clear. You can't live the Christian life unless you know what God has said. And this is why hearing sound gospel preaching and teaching is imperative. This is why studying and meditating on God's word is so crucial. Because it's only as you know God's word that you can then use God's word in the warfare. What wonderful armour your captain and my captain has given us. We have a fierce adversary, but our armour is more than able to deal with him. Let's think thirdly, finally and briefly about our assurance. Our assurance. As we fight the good fight, we have the most wonderful assurance. Not only is our armour more than adequate, our captain is in complete charge and command. Indeed, our supreme saviour has already won the war. Through his sinless life and sacrificial death, 
triumphant resurrection and glorious ascension, our King has already secured the victory over all his and over all our enemies. In Colossians 2 verse 15, Paul tells us that on the cross of Calvary, Jesus disarmed the powers of darkness. Yes, at Calvary, Christ triumphed over the devil and his legions, and he made a public spectacle of them. And so our evil adversary is already a defeated foe. And the devil knows that he's doomed. The devil knows that he's heading to eternal condemnation in hell. But in his evil, the devil seeks to bring down with him as many human beings as he can. So yes, the devil is like a roaring lion seeking to devour Christians. But as you and I abide in Christ and in his word, Satan is a roaring lion who is toothless. For as we remain strong in the Lord and in his mighty power, the devil can't harm us. He will roar. He will try to intimidate you. But in Christ, you are completely safe and secure. Our captains won the victory, and we need only to follow him by faith. And so, my fellow soldiers here in Knockbracken, my fellow soldiers of Christ, we're not fighting for victory. No, we are fighting from victory. We're on the victor side, the one who is the conqueror of all conquerors. Our Saviour has already conquered all his enemies, and as we live and abide in him, we will be more than conquerors who are heading home to glory. Hallelujah.